Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Zoltan Balog, and in the name of the Faculty of Natural Sciences, I welcome you to the award ceremony of the 2018 Heinrich Kainacher Prize. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome Secretary of State Dr. De Ambrogio, University Provost Professor Dr. Leumann, the prize winners Dr. Horstetler, Dr. Tsai, and Professor Dr. Zurbuchen. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two major trends in contemporary research. On one hand, there is a highly specialized disciplinary research. On the other hand, there is the aspect of interdisciplinarity. I'm a theoretical mathematician, so I'm more familiar with the first aspect. But today, I think I would like to emphasize on the second one. Our university and also the Faculty of Natural Sciences greatly encourages, supports, and promotes interdisciplinary research. The Faculty of Natural Sciences is affiliated to at least four research centers that are strategically important and they are directed towards interdisciplinarity. I would like to argue on the behalf of interdisciplinarity for two reasons. Complex problems in nature like climate change or environment are not possible to study with just one single area of expertise. It is necessary that different groups of researchers from different areas, dis different disciplines come together and attack these important problems. The se second aspect I would like to tell you about is the element of surprise. I think that uh, if we combine interdisciplinarity, we might be very much stunned and surprised by the fact to see that there are great similarities between totally different research areas. So I was really surprised and stunned to learn recently that there is a very strong connection between pattern recognition used in astrophysics on one hand and also machine learning in medical imaging. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to see that the nomination for the Heinrich Reinacher Prize 2018 have a large component of interdisciplinarity by focusing to astrophysics and space science research. I would like to ask my colleague, Professor von Steiger, to introduce the prize winners. Mr. State Secretary de Lombrojo, Herr Rector Leumann, Herr Dekan Sultan Balo, ladies and gentlemen, and dear prize winners. My name is Rudi van Steiger. I have the pleasure to be the chairman of the Heinrich Greinacher Foundation since earlier this year, succeeding my colleague Jean-Luc Vuillemier. I welcome you here very warmly to the Heinrich Greinacher Award Ceremony of this year. Heinrich Greinacher, you see him here in the picture, was the director of the Physikalisches Institut, then, or first called the Physikalisches Kabinett, the Physical Cabinet, which might show the uh, weight this institute might have had at the early 20th century. Heinrich Reinacher was 
the director of this cabinet or institute between 1924 and 1952. That's a large number of years. He was the predecessor and, as Ernest Kopp uh, just um, educated me, the actual... Uh, he was the one who got Fritz Hautermann here to Bern, who was his, his successor as the director of the Physikalisches Institute. Fritz Hautermann, who unfortunately didn't fill this position for very long, less than a decade, I think, he was then succeeded by Johannes Geis, who unfortunately today cannot be with us for health reasons, who in turn was succeeded by Peter Boxle, Willy Benz, and Nick Thomas, all present here today. Welcome to you in particular. This today is the 10th hein Heinrich Greinacher Award ceremony. The prize was first awarded in 1998. And on the small webpage of the foundation, you can find uh, all the previous uh, award recipients. Heinrich Greinacher Awards go to researchers who have either made a PhD here in, at the University of Bern or spent a substantial number of years here in Bern and whose research is somehow in a more or less loose way related to the work of Heinrich Greinacher. We will see from the main award recipient today that his relation to Greinacher's work is rather on the more uh, tight side than on the less looser side. Um, here we see Heinrich Greinacher's uh, claim for fame, Heinrich Greinacher, Greinacher Schaltung. I won't go into how it works, and especially I won't try to make it work, because if I were, I would almost certainly break it. And that's not what I should do, because Urs Lauterburg is watching me. Uh, this is also Heinrich Greinacher's, I thought it was the conference badge, which he was uh, carrying around his neck during conferences, but they tell me, no, it's the brass plate from his office door. So now we know who Heinrich Greinacher was. I'm very happy to introduce to you the Heinrich Greinacher Award recipients of this year. And we will begin with two uh, Young Scientist Awards, Nachwuchspreise. Young Scientists Awards are awarded to either PhD or uh, master students for excellent master work. And in this case, we have two PhD recipients of this year. And it is my pleasure to call on the first recipient, Michael Hostetle, to receive his prize. Please, Michael. Michael got his PhD on the 21st of June earlier this year. He is a PhD student of, uh, where is he? Yeah. Antonio Ereditatos. And he worked, his PhD worked primarily at CERN. And the citation for his award, oh, the, P, the title of his PhD was the LHC luminosity performance. LHC stands for the Large Hadron Collider. And he receives the Heinrich Greinacher Young Scientists Award 2018 for his outstanding work on particle accelerator physics carried out for the Large Hadron, Colli Hadron Collider at CERN, for which he developed a novel method for the measurement of the machine emittance and succeeded to substantially increase the machine luminosity. Congratulations and all the best for your future career.
the award committee had a very hard job this year for uh, selecting the uh, Nachwuchspreise, the Young Scientists Awards, and they solved their problem by selecting two awards for two equally outstanding PhD thesis. So I'm very happy to call on Shang Min Tsai for receiving the second, it's not the second, in, it's only the second in sequence, not the second in hierarchy, uh, Heinrich Greinacher Young Scientists Award of 2018. Changmin is a PhD student, was a PhD student, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> last month, until last month, of uh, Kevin Heng, here present. And he worked at the Center for Space and Habitability in exoplanet atmospheric research. His PhD was, is entitled Chemical Kinetics on Exoplanet Atmospheres. And you receive the Heinrich Greinacher Young Scientists Award 2018 for novel contributions on our theoretical understanding of atmospheric chemistry in exoplanets and the advancement of scientific transparency via the development of the first open source chemical kinetics computer code for the exoplanetary atmospheres community. Congratulations, Shangmin, and all the best for your future career. Now I remember I should have advanced this. That was again Mike Michi Hofstetter, Zhang Min Tsai. And now it's you, Thomas. <laughs> Wait a second. Um, the main Heinrich Greinacher Award this year, 2018, goes to Thomas H. Zoebuch. Thomas made his PhD in Bern in 1996, and his work is related to Heinrich Greinacher, as we will see. So he is fully qualified to, re to receive the Heinrich Greinacher Award. Um, at this point, I need to make a disclaimer. Um, as I said, I am presiding the Heinrich Greinacher uh, Foundation since earlier this year. And the first Heinrich Greinacher Award goes to my best friend in science. Now that sounds, that smells fishy, doesn't it? Um, I should make a disclaimer, I have not nominated Thomas for the award. And Heinrich Greinacher Foundation has a selection committee directed, directed by Hubertus Fischer here present. And it was the selection committee who put Thomas in first place. So I duly followed the advice, and the foundation selected Thomas for the Heinrich Greinacher <laughs> Award recipient 2018. Before uh, I hand over the word to you, Thomas, let me uh, very briefly summarize uh, your, your CV. I know we will go to hear much more about it. But one of the first recollections I have is related to this room. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to tell the story about a fire department in Heiligenschwendi. <laughs> I have told that before. No, I, I, I witnessed you here as a musician in this room. Right over there, you were performing together with a few colleagues from the Physics Institute. Probably in 95, Christmas uh, celebration of the Physikalisches Institut, you performed with a few colleagues a few pieces of music. And I specifically remember you contributing to Autumn Leaves, the famous, and one of my favorite standards, written by Cosma on a poem by Jacques Prévert. You performed there on the trombone, and I mention that because you married to a professional musician. Um, the way I remember the performance, no offense, 
I don't remember it as the most swimming performance of, uh, <laughs> of autumn leaves I have ever heard. But that's why you didn't develop into a professional musician, but rather into a professional scientist. I can relate to that, and then you are married to a professional musician. A particular welcome to you, Erin. I'm very happy you are here with us. Um, here's more or less where your transformative journey started. I think it started further up in the Oberland. You will tell us about that, because the other re recollection is not in this room, but very close to it, uh, in, uh, one floor down. When you met in early 96, I'm not sure if it was just before or after your PhD, uh, when you met with Len Fisk, Len Fisk was then uh, already emeritus from his position as the uh, Associate Administrator for Science Missions at NASA, the position you have today. So in this way, one of the loops in your transformative journey is closed today, here and now. From here, with, on the invitation, with the help, support from Len Fisk, you then soon disappeared to Ann Arbor and never came back. Well, yes, today you came back. You started, uh, you launched, I should rather say, in a career in space science. And I'm very happy to, uh, to be a witness of that as a frequent visitor to Ann Arbor and you visitor uh, to Bern. Um, in Ann Arbor, you worked on solar wind observations, but soon on other observations as well. You became an instrument developer there. Uh, you constructed basically uh, the FIPS instrument, which was then going to, on message and going to uh, Mercury. And you uh, observed Mercury with it. And on the, on, in parallel, you also worked in space plasma physics, in theoretical space plasma physics. A very broad career, but even th that was not broad en enough for you. After a while, you became the founding director of a new center for entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan, uh, something which looked like a diversion at the time. But I'm sure this diversion filled your basket of skills even more and finally made you, prepared you for your today's position at NASA. I think you are very, very broad, and that's why you are one of the most deserving re recipients of the Heinrich Greinacher Award. This is not the first award you get. Uh, there's a whole sequence of awards on your uh, CV, which everybody can find online, but I won't steal any much more of your time. I only mention one, the Pekka C Award, Presidential, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, which you received from the hands of then President George W. Bush in the White House. Today, you are at the, up to this uh, day, at the culmination point in your position at NASA as the Associate Administrator, following in the footsteps of Len, and uh, serving the science community in an uh, unprecedented manner. Today you are back in Bern. You're closing, as I said, another loop from you in your transformative journey, which you are going to tell you, to tell us uh, in just a few minutes. Now I ask you, Thomas, to come up and receive your award. Professor Heinrich Greinacher Award 2018 is awarded to Thomas H. Zurbuchen in recognition of his work in the field of space science in the broadest sense, stretching from your role as an innovative instrument designer and builder 
uh, your role as data analysis and the interpreter of solar wind plasma data from many space missions, but from also from studying Mercury's magnetosphere in detail to theoretical work in space plasma research, and all the way to becoming one of the most supreme advocates of space science in your new role, not so new anymore, as NASA Associate Administrator for Science Missions. Congratulations, Thomas, and Thank you all the best for your future. Thank you. That's it. Please, Thomas. So about music, I thought uh, I'm a pretty good musician until I met my family. Uh, we're four members in our immediate family. I'm number four by a big step from number three down. Uh, my wife, of course, is a bass player and plays piano better than most uh, people who say they're pianists. And then uh, my kids are playing uh, bass and trombone as well. Uh, Lucas took over my trombone. In a half a year, he outdid my five years. And uh, my girl uh, is playing drums. And so we have a good jazz band at home. That's my point. Uh, of this whole story. And I'm just really glad you're here. I love you very much. Thanks for uh, being up there. They were uh, touching down uh, with an airplane just a few hours ago. So when you fall asleep, I throw something in your direction. How about that? Um, uh, I'm, I also want to thank uh, all my teachers who are here. Uh, of course, starting with Peter Bochsler, who was uh, uh, my advisor for my uh, doctorate. Uh, Peter, uh, who is a, a very uh, a unconventional leader. Uh, of uh, most of the, the leaders I've had uh, and what he, what he has done, I think what really helped me is from the beginning, uh, from uh, just a few months in, he gave me a responsibility that most people never get until they're uh, in their doctorate. He said, here's $30,000, go, uh, sorry, Swiss francs, uh, go make those uh, measurements out, out there in Freiburg. And it was kind of a shop that uh, had some problems. And uh, of course we did the measurements uh, but, uh, you know, that responsibility was just really enabling. He also sent me to summer schools all over the uh, country, uh, all over the, uh, Europe, actually, and uh, over to Moscow. And, and so I met people that I still consider my friends in, in these summer schools. I just will be forever grateful to him. Uh, some of my uh, best teachers that I learned a lot from are here, uh, uh, Professor Leutwiller and Pepe, uh, the best teachers I've ever really had uh, the benefit of listening to. I think uh, the way they talked about physics uh, was in every way um, we, you know, reflective of that beauty that you talked about uh, earlier. Uh, the beauty of uh, science, the clarity uh, that comes from understanding a theoretical context, a concept that uh, at the beginning when you start thinking about it sounds perplexing and you know, how could that possibly describe nature, when you're done, uh, you recognize the power that comes with it uh, to take that concept and apply it to so many different problems that, uh, uh, in part, uh, of course, relate to the very thing that we're going to talk about today. And it's these tools that uh, I've, uh, I've used all my life, uh, whether it's in science or elsewhere, uh, because the world is full of numbers and, and kind of relationships. And uh, these equations, they matter everywhere. Uh, the other I think, of course, is uh, that I learned from them to actually explain things simply. It's, uh, science is about taking complicated things and make them simple, not the other way around. And so, so I've always take, taken that as an inspiration, and I really uh, appreciate uh, uh, what they have done. Uh, I want to talk about the transformative journey. I want to start uh, with a picture. And the picture, of course, is very well known in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, I call it science hiding in plain sight. Science, of course, uh, is that uh, chocolate paper over here, uh, standing next to Buzz Aldrin. Uh, 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 foil, of course, uh, designed just the right way uh, around here with a team uh, that deserves a lot of credit, but uh, led by Johannes Geis. Uh, it's that uh, standing next to Buzz Aldrin, uh, one of the most legendary uh, astronauts, uh, one of the two uh, moonwalkers of uh, Apollo 11. Uh, after the uh, journey that, uh, of course, has uh, made history. Uh, what, what I really wanted to show you, and I brought something for you, and I hope before you leave, uh, 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 there should be enough of you. I brought a calendar, and what we're doing at NASA, in NASA Science, it's kind of uh, every scientist wants to be in that calendar. So as I leave through it, uh, of course, uh, 
Uh, you see pictures, uh, kind of my criterion of the picture is even if you're not a scientist, you still have to think it's beautiful. Uh, and so, so, you know, there's amazing uh, pictures in, the, in here about the Earth, about galaxies. And of course, next year is the anniversary year of Apollo. And what I thought uh, with me uh, being the, the science lead at the agency, that picture deserves to be in July. So kind of everywhere in uh, tens of thousands of households uh, all around the world, uh, this will be the picture that is there. And of course, if you read it, uh, you'll read that, uh, of course, this university is acknowledged uh, together with Johannes Geis, uh, whom I really want to uh, uh, send my appreciation. He's not here. Um, and, uh, and I just uh, I want to uh, just uh, say how much uh, we all benefited uh, from his transformative journey. His transformative journey uh, that in many ways started small with a small, simple step. The idea behind this, it's the simplest experiment, frankly, I've seen. Uh, Dr. Bonnet has, you know, run the European Space Agency science program. You've seen a lot of experiments. Have you ever seen a simpler experiment? I mean, it, it is absolutely uh, sophisticated. It's, it's beautiful because of its uh, simplicity. And of course, what we learned from these uh, uh, samples, uh, I would say we only eclipsed in terms of accuracy in the late 90s, Peter, would you say? Uh, uh, basically, the point is this uh, has a tremendous longevity, uh, these measurements. So I hope you take this calendar home and celebrate uh, with me uh, the, the beauty of science, but also uh, the achievement of this uh, transformer of uh, our knowledge uh, of uh, the, the uh, solar system, uh, Johannes Geis and everybody uh, in, in his team. Uh, you don't win uh, by yourself. I, well, I thought a lot about transforming, of course, because uh, what this is is a transformer in some ways. I'm going to uh, talk to you about it a little bit. But I think uh, kind of whenever I give a talk, I want to give you the bottom line up front. Sometimes I wonder what has helped me uh, be more successful than so many of my friends who are getting doctorates in, you know, uh, environments uh, that in every way is as, uh, as uh, fruitful, as amazing as this one. And I think one of the things that I learned here, and I'm going to talk you through it, that transformation, major inputs, major differences in knowledge, the way we leap from one way of knowledge to another, uh, which of course is a long process, I'm going to talk to you about it, really has two important steps. And you have to respect both of them. If you only respect one of them, there's no transformation. Uh, the first one is big leaps in thinking, big leaps in, in understanding. Uh, what one, the one thing about big leaps is actually that so often a big leap First of all, you can't tell whether it's crazy or a big leap uh, when you start. Uh, that's the first rule. Uh, second one is that most big leaps are actually not that big when they happen because of another thing that happened. There's a lot of small steps that have to occur. A lot of things that have to occur, which is I would call almost like grinding it out, like steps that relate to sophisticated accuracy, to a lab work that in every way is mind-boggling and difficulty because of the many things that can go wrong. These small steps, I believe, uh, are just as important as the intellectual big leaps of the type that you talked about, uh, you know, at the con, you know, uh, to create, achieve that uh, tremendous transformation uh, that uh, we have here. And so I want to talk to you about this from the point of view of this uh, circuit that's on the table there. But I also want to talk about it from the point of view of my story that went forward, really making uh, that point. Uh, both of them are uh, really important. Uh, everything you uh, said earlier is here, and I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, the whole point of it is, uh, kind of, if you look at this circuit, and, and trust me, I'm not going to get into uh, all the details. I can. I actually spent the time, so I could do it. Uh, basically, uh, what this all is about is, is actually a simple piece of circuitry. It's only one, two, three, four. Uh, pieces, kind of uh, diodes, and you know, simple, uh, simple pieces, capacitance, you know, that that basically take um, uh, uh, changing a voltage and turn it into a, multi a multiple of it. And uh, what's important about this circuit is it can be stacked. So what you do is almost like uh, this other patent uh, that is a patent from uh, all the way back. Uh, almost from the same year, actually a little bit later. Uh, so it's kind of all the way back from at the beginning of the space age. This, of course, you recognize it's the patent for Lego. And so basically, 
you think, okay, what's important about this? Well, it's important about it is that little piece uh, with these uh, shapes uh, have the enough friction that whatever you build is not falling apart because it's basically held down by the friction. So you can take this piece and stack it and you build something like that. You know, something that is in every way much more magnificent right at the heart of this is the very uh, piece that is there. Now, I just want to tell you what that means uh, for the U.S. space program. Uh, I always show this chart, and it's basically all the missions that we are doing right now uh, in both phase are the missions that are under development. In regular fund, they're the ones that are flying. Uh, with asterisks, are the ones uh, that another agency or another country is leading. And so you, know, if you can go figure out your uh, favorite one. And every day, there's something that's really uh, mind-boggling. Today, uh, what's uh, on my mind is this uh, spacecraft over there, Voyager 2 was in the news uh, last week uh, because it was uh, the second uh, spacecraft to cross through the heliopause. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of the, at the interface of the sphere of influence of the sun to the sphere of influence of the galaxy. It's now kind of sitting, if you want, in galactic plasma and uh, basically in galactic field. And so to measure the field, what we tried to do uh, during last uh, week, actually just the last few uh, days, is to turn the spacecraft and turn it around into a loop. Uh, the reason we do that is, of course, uh, you know, divergence B equals zero. And so basically, uh, by doing this, you basically get rid of offsets uh, that are there. And you basically know how to uh, look at the self-generated fields, which is significant compared to the field around it, because the field is so tiny up there. So it's a really important measurement. Well, when you do this kind of stuff, uh, the one thing that we tend to forget, that when I say here on Earth, do this, Voyager hears it 19 hours later, and then it says, yes, I did it. 19 hours later, we hear it again. The speed of light is too small uh, for, for us to, you know, uh, for, for those of us who are impatient. And, and so basically what we're doing is as we turn this thing, uh, you know, uh, the spacecraft, uh, you know, turned a little bit cooler. And so, so I'm, I'm reading emails here trying to uh, learn exactly what happened to that spacecraft. Any one day, there's like two to five emails from any one of those missions. Uh, that's the email I just read. So each one of them has a story. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is not to talk about all these missions, but to talk about the missions that at their heart have the Greinacher circuit. Here they are. All of these missions have, and I've analyzed them, actually I hired some uh, engineer to uh, look at it too, have at their heart that circuit. They have at their heart a circuit that was invented around here and stacked up into very amazing investigations that transform our knowledge in a way that I'm going to ar argue uh, is, is uh, something for the books, for the history books, right? And, and it's at the heart of it, um, that circuit, that is such an enabling part. I'm going to tell you about my story about this one too. Everyone who's built a Greinacher circuit also knows how hard it is in terms of engineering. Uh, really, really, really difficult to build high voltages on a spacecraft. And we all have, you know, less hair or more gray hair because of Greinacher circuits uh, that, are, that are out there. I'm not going to tell you my story. But uh, this is where they are. So if you add it, uh, this sits between a third uh, to half of all missions in NASA's portfolio. If, I'm sure if I showed ESA's portfolio, it would be a very similar number. Basically, everything that has X-rays, everything that has high-voltage particles, everything that has lasers uh, right now uh, uh, has at the, at the center of it that circuit. And, uh, and so I just uh, uh, I want to talk about that, what I believe kind of at the beginning, at the invention, looked like a pretty small step the accuracy of that turning into a transformation of knowledge. So I'm giving you some examples. The first one is uh, ExoMars. So advertisement around this is a place that is very deeply uh, involved with uh, ExoMars. And of course, uh, uh, um, uh, part of that is an instrument built in the US and it is focused on organic compounds of Mars. Remember, of course, what happened there at Mars? Um, when we started thinking about Mars, when I was a student here, uh, you know, we thought of Mars as a really dry, Vast, you know, a, a, a desert uh, landscape with basically no water. Uh, we thought about initially, and uh, and water in the past probably. We thought about the channels where, where we are today. As uh, we recognize, not only is there water 
there was water there before. We have absolute proof of that, uh, 150 meters in a large fraction of the planet. But also, there's organics that so far have escaped all the investigation because we, we built the wrong instruments. The instruments were not sophisticated enough. This is the next generation of instrument that it will look at compounds at much larger uh, masses, at much larger uh, mass per charges with uh, uh, basically really looking at uh, biosignatures uh, together in a, you know, uh, 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 mass spectrometry and chromatography approach, just like uh, people are used around here, uh, and, and uh, really uh, doing so uh, with laser ionization. At the heart of that instrument, is that circuit. Do you remember the two parts that were there? Well, one of them are blue and the other one or whatever, that gold. That is, uh, as part of this uh, instrument, is right there. The circuit board uh, is, is, right, is right there, uh, uh, very visible. Uh, this is another uh, spacecraft. In fact, it's a spacecraft that we launched. We launched it something like three months ago. It's a, it's a, a laser uh, altimeter is basically flying in a polar orbit around uh, the Earth, and it's basically shooting down eight lasers, green lasers, and basically th what that are bouncing off ice surfaces. Now, of course, ice is really important to us as the, the cryosphere and the water levels. They relate to each other in a causal fashion. Uh, kind of, you melt a lot of this, it ends up elsewhere uh, in the oceans. Uh, always uh, remember that close to 70% of the population lifts in coastal areas and so so basically water uh, levels are directly affecting many many lives all around the earth uh, in the us but they're very much in europe and elsewhere uh, all around the earth so so the question is what's happening to that ice and there's a lot of research going on because of the fact that this has such a tremendous societal uh, importance and of course uh, uh in there is that laser by the way it was really hard to do uh, that laser uh, uh, with its accuracy, with its, uh, with its power that we need to actually shine down from several hundred kilometers and then look at the reflected light. We shine it down 10,000 times per second. Uh, and so basically with the speed that gives us a spatial resolution of a meter, uh, the, uh, the resolution of time, because the speed of light is constant through vacuum, right? Uh, we basically is uh, with an accuracy of close to a half a centimeter. Uh, so basically, we're mapping out uh, this thing, and this is the first result, kind of the first uh, global map. Kind of the good news is, if you're interested at the pole, it helps if you're in a polar orbit, you fly a lot over ice, right? So it's kind of, you paint uh, the environment uh, quite a lot. This is an elevation map by itself that there's not a lot of news. So kind of the uh, Earth scientists among you is like, well, what's new? Well, what's interesting here is that we can pair that now with the first measurements from a different uh, uh, instrument of snowfall globally uh, there. And we actually can learn about sources and sinks of, of uh, uh, the water that's frozen there uh, with this at the level we've never seen it. The stories are a lot more complicated than we thought even five years ago, uh, you know, where uh, actually certain areas, uh, overall snowfall is way up. So why is it melting? Well, melting is also way up uh, and it's not melting the same everywhere and so certain regions uh, melt faster than others. And that's the kind of science that, of course, feeds directly into models of the type that uh, we look at to make predictions as to uh, what will happen here on Earth and elsewhere. Again, at the heart of it, that very circuit. Um, I want to talk to you about an astrophysics uh, payload. It's an astrophysics payload that's hanging from the space station. Uh, this, now, this time it's the real space station, not the one with Legos. Uh, it's hanging out off the side and basically is looking at uh, X-rays and uh, high uh, energy X-rays with very, very high uh, spatial resolution. And it's looking at that actually uh, kind of the way it's, it's, it, it's orienting itself and its own clock is so accurate that, that it can actually, uh, that the goal is to, to measure the equation of state of neutron stars. Uh, but there's a paper that just came out that's looking at, um, at uh, black hole. Black holes, of course, when I sat in these benches, uh, were really great constructs that, are, that came part out of uh, general relativity with uh, you know, hypotheses we all learned about. Uh, we are using black holes on a regular basis, observing them now, and there's so many surprises. One of them is that the X-ray emissions from black holes, kind of in the corona around black holes, changes at the time scale of minutes. And we can measure those uh, changes of these timescales as uh, these different colors 
uh, indicate. So we are learning about these objects. Uh, by the way, with other ground-based observations that are coming online, more information is added to that. I think we're going to end up in the next few uh, years um, into kind of an entirely new analysis of these amazing objects, uh, where we're basically looking at them at the level that we've never uh, uh, seen before. Again, looking at uh, these objects that were entirely theoretical, enabled uh, by at the, at the in part uh, by uh, the very circuits that we're talking about. I want to go back to Mars and talk to you about uh, an instrument that we're building uh, right now. And I spent a lot of time last week uh, spending, actually on Monday even, uh, with, uh, with this uh, particular instrument. It's an X-ray um, uh, uh, detector kind of with, with something like uh, 100 microns of resolution of uh, X-ray emissions, uh, really with the goal of measuring these, cons these uh, contributions to uh, any sample. Uh, the goal of us uh, building that is of course uh, through these excitation lines and uh, from 13 to 17 kilovolt is to to actually learn about the composition because guess what we want to bring some of these samples and bring them into the labs such as the labs that are around here or all around the world to actually look at these samples because uh, what we're really interested in is of course i talked to you about the organics uh, that are up there but the question really is are there are there in fact uh traces or or kind of fossil leftovers, so to say, of ancient lives uh, that, that may have been there uh, three billion years ago uh, when something happened to Mars that made it evolve very differently uh, than the Earth has, uh, our sister planet. So, so basically uh, what we're doing that in the heart of it, you know how to look at it now, kind of whenever it looks like a stair, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, the, the very circuit that's there, uh, of course, in smaller, in smaller uh, parts now, we know how to make it smaller. And I can tell you, uh, the reason I spend time on it on Monday is because we're struggling with that guy. Uh, one of the parts, uh, as so always, is, is you know, a little bit finicky. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, the power supplies that I built to go to Mercury, I had to build twice uh, because uh, the first time, frankly, didn't work uh, so well. We had to totally change the concept. It is hard to build these voltages and thank God for the simplicity of that circuit. So we can actually uh, uh, actually be successful after we have the art and actually learn these, what I point out as small steps, uh, these important detailed analysis and these important uh, te technical uh, handling of these uh, steps and, and the potting, the, the, the surface uh, uh, treatments that, that make these successful. So basically what I'm gonna talk to you about and kind of I wanna illustrate uh, with uh, experiences around here is really that point. Uh, kind of uh, for me, these transformation knowledge of the type that I'm talking about, whether it's finding life elsewhere, whether it's uh, discovering the secrets of the universe, whether it's understanding our home planet in a totally new way, uh, come uh, because of uh, you know uh, small steps, inherent struggles to understand process details and errors, but also because of the desire to unify what we learn into new ways of thinking and enabling new innovation. Another way I talk about that is big leaps. Uh, transformative leaps require both in-depth understanding of these small steps and enable innovation. If you only do small steps and never go do the other thing, uh, you become a person who's really, really good at just the small steps and probably will never be named in the context of this. If you only do the big leaps, uh, it's very hard often to kind of touch the ground. And so it's actually hard to figure out uh, what is, uh, is able or at least have awareness of these other small steps. It's hard to figure out, as I said, the difference between innovation or something that's just out in the clouds, a good idea that didn't matter for nature. So, so basically, uh, so now it's going to start interweaving uh, with my story and I'm going to uh, tell you a part of it. Of course, uh, I grew up, uh, this is uh, if you walk from our house where I grew up, uh, probably 10 minutes uh, kind of towards uh, by the farms and you look down, that's how it looks. And, and of course, uh, what's the most important thing in that picture is, is the sky. Uh, the sky, of course, is a dark sky. Uh, it's easy to um, understand um, the uh, environment, but it's an environment, uh, you know, to understand and appreciate the stars that I want to meant to say. Uh, also understand the beauty of nature, which I believe is so often what motivates us to, to really see these uh, broader uh, big concepts, but what I understood, what I learned there is the appreciation 
of doing things right. Uh, that's what was valued there. And I, I always felt that set me up for success. I never felt that was a disadvantage. I always felt that was an advantage. And so, so basically, work hard and uh, persevering through small steps, striving for excellent matters. I really believe this is something that I believe uh, people who get education here, they get that. I think many people around the world don't. And I think that's an advantage that so many of the students, you who are doing PhDs that, that, that you get from here, uh, that is a unique understanding. It, it, uh, the excellent shows, uh, regardless of job or op occupation, you know if somebody is excellent, whether that person is a waitress, whether that person is a mechanical uh, technician, or that person is fill in the blank, a physicist. You will get excellence. You see it there. And, uh, and you respect the others uh, uh, because you are not much better than them. Uh, sometimes it's important to recognize that not every vote counts the same way. I think one of the, uh, one of the things, and uh, sorry for the bad words in advance, but one of the things Peter Boxer taught me is like, somebody tells you you're an idiot, don't believe him the first time. Perhaps the second or the third, but, but don't, don't stop in your tracks just because somebody don't, doesn't believe that you're right. And I think, so, so yeah, sometimes you have to, to basically say, well, I'm going to stand my ground for now until I'm convinced that I'm wrong, not just because the first person walked up to my poster at a conference and said I'm wrong. That happened to me, by the way. I thought my career is over. They said, it's all wrong. Then I realized it's a joke. It's like just before I was uh, jumping over that bridge. No, I'm just kidding. So, 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 so basically, the, the point is uh, respect the others. Um, uh, uh, and uh, respect that uh, the importance of small steps. I went then to Gymnasium Tune, uh, which uh, for me, I always said, like I, I gave a talk this morning to a bunch of students in a gymnasium, and I, you know, many people ask me, what's the the biggest step you ever took? I always said, it's to go to gymnasium, uh, because for me, the the difference from the kind of uh, small uh, uh, town with less than 500 people. Uh, to a uh, gymnasium uh, opened the, the door up for me to that thinking uh, that uh, I'll call it the thinking of big leaps. I remember that class uh, that made me convinced that physics is a good career. It's a class uh, not about uh, equations of physics, but the Copernican revolution. The fact that science not only changes what we know, but how we think is amazing. Uh, uh, you lift that in earth science every day. Uh, you know, Dr. Stocker, you, I mean, we think differently about our planet because of the work you do and others. It's not just what we know, it's how we think about life itself, about uh, our uh, environment itself. And I think you learn that not because just studying science, but because of studying history, because of studying uh, uh, languages, other things, because of a breadth of understanding that bigger thinking that it comes from a liberal arts education. I really am a believer in that. I'm a strong believer that that is important as we go forward. I worry tremendously if our scientists are only good at science. Uh, I think they should be good at science. They don't have to be as broad as me. Not everybody should do that. But the point is, you have to understand that breadth because otherwise, inadvertently, after some time, you'll make the wrong decision. So big leaps matter, I learned there. Uh, I was made aware of this. I started reading. I took over the library and started reading the physics section from left to right and kind of many things that I benefited from. But science has the power to transform uh, how we think about reality. Even the most profound leaps rely on incremental work. Uh, the story of Einstein is a good one. Uh, there's better historians here. I see uh, uh, Professor Gorsha here uh, sitting uh, there. You know, he could tell the story a lot better. The, how many of these important pieces of work in 1905, where we met in 2005, where we met for the first time, uh, uh, Mr. State Secretary, uh, you know, uh, come from work in lab work or in work on geometry or other things that were there ahead of it. And so it relies on that. And we have to have the courage, of course, to change uh, some of these assumptions that we've had and kind of sacrifice them uh, for, better, for better thinking afterwards. That is really hard. And again, I already said, uh, it's hard to judge whether something is a great idea or something just crazy. Uh, only the hard follow-up work can distinguish the two so often. And sometimes it takes many, many years. Uh, some of these predictions uh, that uh, we started to prove that Einstein made in his uh, theories uh, took uh, close to 100 years. Um, frame dragging, uh, really good 
uh, measurement that we have pretty good air bars on now, some of them from space, there's some others, uh, came from, uh, you know, took many, many years, gravitational waves. I remember the Nobel Prize just a few, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, frankly, the first time you think about gravitational waves, uh, you're convinced that will never be measured because it's like, you what? Want to measure displacement of a fraction of an atom over a distance of many kilometers? That's nuts. Well, there's many great breakthroughs, a lot of small steps that got us there. And I uh, made that measurement that's transformative, in my opinion. Uh, things that are just about to happen right now, I believe, is uh, uh, mapping the uh, event horizon of a black hole. Uh, if you think about that, uh, kind of at arm's length, the event horizon of a black hole is an atom, a hydrogen atom. That's the angle. Uh, that's small, by the way. And so, so basically, can you really map that? Well, I don't know. We're about to, I think. I may be wrong. I may be 10 years too early. But the point is, this is what we're doing. It's kind of these kind of things come from steps that go forward for kind of practitioners of science uh, that are in every way as important uh, for that transformation. What you're looking at is a picture that was taken by uh, Hubble uh, in a dark patch of the sky. So this is a uh, Sfufi. And so on there is a face, of course. Uh, what's her name? Herfetia. Is that the Swiss? And uh, if you look at the eye of that face uh, at uh, arm's length, uh, the angle is just about uh, the angle that it was filled with that, uh, with that aperture, that deep uh, exposure of the Hubble. In that deep exposure, what you looked at are galaxies over galaxies, close to 6,000 galaxies were found there in that dark patch. So it was, we looked at it because it was, there was nothing there. Uh, nothingness is not nothing once you start going and look at it with this marvel of technology. It's full of wonders. It's full of uh, galaxies. What we know now from another deep exposure of Chandra, at each one of those galaxies as a black hole. Black holes, as I said earlier, were, were great predictions uh, that, were, uh, that came forward. We now know that black holes are part of probably the genesis of galaxies in a way we never appreciated before. Frankly, there's a big fight going on what is first. It's one of those chicken and egg problems, galaxy and black holes. It's a really exciting uh, discussion that happens uh, from uh, that. I came here, and uh, I, it's a step I never regret. Frankly, I came here just because it was reachable by train from Heilig and Schwendi. Um, uh, I'll be very frank, uh, there was not a lot of thinking. It's like, what's the closest university? Okay, that's where I'm going. And I never regretted it because uh, here, uh, and I already mentioned it, uh, I uh, learned uh, the tedious work of making something work. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, not what I really did, but uh, you know, like probably the two worst weeks of my life uh, were uh, in Fortgeschritten Praktikum, uh, trying to double the frequency of a laser. I think that that experiment must depend on the moon phase and some constellations <laughs> in the back of the solar system in some profound fashion, or you cough and it's out of focus again before you can actually take the darn measurement and move on. It took me two weeks to make that work. Well, I tell you, uh, when I meet our lasers experts now, I have a full appreciation of what they have to do. Not just because of the two weeks, I did some other things also with lasers, but the point is, I love that kind of work. It's just the same way I love actually going through these equations on the board or on yourself, by, by yourself, whether it's a Schrodinger equation with a simple uh, problem that you know somebody has already solved 10,000 times, doing it yourself is one of those things we learned here. Besides, of course, uh, the big ideas I learned here. I think we learned this here better than many of the people that I've ever mentored, people that I hired. There's a lot of people in my team from uh, you know, universities that if you looked at any ranking are well ahead, uh, well ahead of some of the things that, that I went to. Uh, I know that better. And, uh, and we, we uh, really have always benefited from it. Uh, uh, what also is important here is that we have a coffee room and remember, 
Uh, what actually the, the third element I'm going to bring in is going to talk about small stuff on big leaps. I'm going to talk about big leaps in the context of our teachers. Frankly, that's why I talked about it here. We're at the university. One of the most important enabler of big leaps is mentorship. One of the most important of big leaps is giving somebody a chance that they don't deserve. That's what I got here. Uh, I already talked about what Peter Boxster did for me. But you know uh, what I did is I went down to the coffee shop. That's where I always went because I'm a social human being. I kind of, after a while, sitting at my desk, I needed to meet some people like Rudy and others. You said, wake up, right? Yeah. So, so, so basically, I went to uh, the coffee uh, room downstairs, and there was a guy sitting there and next to Johannes Geis, and they were talking about science. And I loved how they talked about science. Uh, Len Fisk, of course, uh, uh, was the associate administrator at NASA, which is another way of saying the director of science at NASA, uh, uh, until four years before I met him there. And so he talked about science, something that really excited him. By the way, entirely wrong. Everything he said there is entirely wrong. I reminded him of that uh, from time to time. But that's fine. Uh, big uh, it's perfectly fine. If you want to be a big leaper, you need to be wrong at times. Otherwise, you're, uh, you, uh, there's no such thing as, as, as not being wrong from time to time. I, like, don't point me to the paper that you were wrong. Otherwise, I won't hire you. So, 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 for, so, so for me, uh, I was sitting there, and I basically, frankly, I was so excited about this. Entirely wrong, as I said. But it was a totally new way of looking at uh, the solar wind in this case. And I basically asked, uh, hey, uh, I, mean, I was from the machine. I was listening, which you're not supposed to do. It's not nice. But I was listening, and I basically, Johannes Geis was there and said, Johannes, uh, uh, is it okay if I sit here and just listen? I won't talk. And I said, oh, sure. I didn't know who the other guy was, by the way. It's like, oh, I meet uh, Dr. Fisk. And I sat there, and I just listened, right? Because I l when you hear science explained, whether it's in a classroom, or by somebody who's truly passionate at it, it I mean, I will always remember those things. I remember science. It's a visceral experience, not something that happens in your head. It's something that you feel with all your body if you learn something. It's like, you know, so for me, that's what's so exciting. I sat there and I listened. And uh, what Fisk did is after like an hour of talking, uh, people who know him, you know, he talks a lot. Uh, so, so after an hour of talking, he turned out, he's like, what do you think? And, uh, and I, I said, I'm really worried about this idea. And I told him the three data uh, sets that worried me about it. And he says, let's go for lunch. And as Rudy said, after lunch, he said, why don't you come work with me? Uh, frankly, the reason I worked with him is because I failed at getting a job in the UK. I actually wanted to find a job in the UK. Uh, Eric Priest, if you remember him uh, up there, uh, uh, I remind him from time to time. And he's already filled with guilt every time I walk in the door, so I stopped doing it. But, uh, but he, he, I had, you know, salary uh, from the Nazi and Alpha. I couldn't even, he wouldn't give me an office for free, uh, kind of without having to pay me. Uh, and, and so the best thing that ever happened is the doors that are closed. And so kind of this kind of door that was open uh, became uh, something uh, uh, that I will never forget. Len Fisk, of course, became my mentor. Uh, he's a guy who taught me everything I know about kind of how the U.S. works. Uh, kind of, uh, he sent me to Capitol Hill to go advocate for science uh, to Congress people long before I had even a green card. I was there with my Swiss passport in my pocket and pretending I'm a citizen. And I didn't lie, of course, but <laughs> but with my Swiss accent, you know, tell them how uh, you know how they should pay grad students more, you know, things like that. And uh, and uh, Len Fisk was there. Len Fisk was also. Uh, at 2.30 in the morning uh, at our house when our daughter was born uh, to watch our son uh, because he became not only a mentor but a friend. And so for me, that's what happened here. The point, the reason I'm telling you that sometimes big leaps in our lives look like small opportunities. And the difference between the ones who take it and the ones who don't are the ones that actually notice it and jump. So often, you know, I give people a business card. It's like, let me know if I can help. Uh, I've kept some statistic over time. It's less than 5% of people who ever get back. And by the way, I make it a habit. I'm not going to give you all a business card now. Since you know my secret, I make it a habit to help them, actually. I have given somebody, I've found for somebody a uh, job that changed her life, too. Uh, somebody who just got my card. I did other things like that. 
sometimes these things that we do around education are in every way uh, the leaps that we need, uh, that, uh, that others need to kind of advance uh, that cause uh, forward. And that's what I want to talk to you. So I want to tell you just one of uh, the science topics before I get uh, to the end, kind of tell you a story and, and kind of stop and get into the Q&A. And it has to do with Messenger. Messenger, of course, is the first orbiter about Mercury, uh, it's, uh, uh, which will be followed up by something much more sophisticated uh, with Pepe Colombo and uh, it's, you know, the Japanese mission that it's carrying uh, that is going to go into orbit in seven years or so about uh, uh, planet Mercury. Uh, this one is a much simpler uh, mission uh, and, uh, of course, changed how we look at this planet, the innermost uh, terrestrial planet, uh, a planet that is a much more rich and geologically active than we ever thought with different uh, components with water at, uh, at the pole, poles and in, in, in craters, kind of things that we thought was, uh, was crazy uh, when you thought about it. Uh, but uh, it's a planet uh, that uh, has an exosphere. So it's, uh, it doesn't have, it has a magnetic field, a global magnetic field, the only other terrestrial planet who has that, frankly, uh, because of, uh, we don't understand. Frankly, we do not understand what really is the reason for an active dynamo uh, we have a lot of ideas, uh, but we don't really understand how to predict an active dynamo and dynamos that stop. Well, it has an active dynamo, even though there's a lot of theories that say they can't because of this tremendous iron core and uh, that only a little as uh, well. Well, what, we, what was done here uh, in a paper uh, that came out uh, uh, something like 10 years ago is actually an investigation of mercury uh, really close to the sun. It's an investigation in sodium. Well, sodium is a material that there's something special about it. And that is that there's a line in the sun that it resonates, that it excites in a resonant fashion. So it just so happens that a helium line at the sun kind of makes the sodium glow and stands out like a sore thumb. So what you see uh, there in that analysis uh, from actually previous to us going in orbit around uh, Mercury is that sodium is present in the exosphere of Mercury. The reason I'm calling the word not atmosphere, exosphere is because the mass of Mercury is too small. So basically what happens is even though the atoms really like to be there and like to be in atmosphere, whenever they, they get kicked a little bit, they get enough energy and float away. So, so they exit uh, the atmosphere, hence an exosphere. So, so, so basically, uh, so they know that there was sodium there. The question was, what was there really? We've never been there. So we have to be in orbit. And uh, the instrument I built uh, was around, um, uh, was on this uh, spacecraft actually hidden by that heat shield, a heat shield that uh, basically protected us. Uh, the instrument itself with its Greinacher circuit uh, was at room temperature, uh, even though the front uh, was at many hundred degrees, up to a thousand degrees uh, in, in the worst of, of all cases. Uh, and, and so we did measurements of that. And uh, one of the measurements that was enabled by that very circuit uh, that, I, uh, that we built with our team uh, is that uh, exospheric measurement. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know the periodic uh, table of the elements by heart, I uh, have a hard time uh, with this. But uh, of course, um, uh, first of all, sodium is that peak right there. So the biggest peak in the atmosphere is sodium, which is not from the sun. It's from the body itself. So kind of the, the environment, the exosphere is fed by, by material to a dominant fashion. It's fed by a material that's coming from the interior of this planet or from the surface of this planet in a way that indicates activity. By the, by the way, there's other uh, measurements of sodium. We know a lot about the overall distribution. There is oxygen. Uh, there, is, there may be some uh, water uh, there, I don't know. I wouldn't go bet my car on it. And uh, I always said you have to, you know, bet your car if you want to put a, 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 a paper out uh, because you can lose your car and still live, uh, you know. So, but it has to be painful a little bit if you're wrong. But uh, so we, we said in that paper that maybe water, and of course, there's other elements like uh, carbon, oxygen, things that we see in the solar wind, which of course are very similar to our magnetosphere. The point is that sodium that we saw from afar was not only happened to be kind of the, the tail on the dog, it was the dog, right? It was the important contributor of this, uh, one of these uh, uh, contributions that are there. Uh, I'm a strong believer 
in paying forward. I spend a lot of time. Uh, this uh, picture on the left is a gymnasium tune. Uh, I love, uh, whenever I come here, I love uh, meeting with people there. I just think uh, the work that we do as scientists is great. I love skiing uh, with my students uh, uh, because of two reasons. First of all, I can ski. Uh, the other one is, uh, the second is, is I could uh, hang out. Uh, she uh, is, uh, is a, a manager of one of the missions uh, that I could go to right now. She's a person who sat in my classroom. And I taught her a lot about uh, a variety of things. Most of what she knows, though, she learned on her own. She's just she's one of the best leaders I've ever had the uh, pleasure of interacting with. Uh, uh, a leader uh, who I think we're going to hear uh, more about. I uh, want to uh, pay forward. Uh, sometimes I'm uh, the one on the receiving end. That guy in the middle here is Eugene Parker, who uh, basically uh, close to uh, 15 missions in all of uh, our portfolio are focused on things that he predicted, including the solar wind. Uh, we have named one mission after him. Uh, I remember Eugene showing up into my seminar when I was a, a postdoc and actually spending time. Uh, and I kind of, what, what I always loved about it is he, I said, how do I introduce you? He's one of the most distinguished uh, people that I've ever, ever met. And he basically said, introduce me as the guy who after a PhD, barely could find a job. After two years, was fired from his job until somebody picked him up uh, and got him a job. The somebody, by the way, was Chandra Sekhar. So anyway, got him a job at the University of Chicago. And he basically said, it's the guy who also, when he actually found the first thing to publish, uh, both referees rejected him. And only because of Chandra Sekhar, who was the editor of the journal, not being able to find a mistake with it, was it published. As I said, as they say, the rest is history. Uh, everything he predicted there is part of every class that we teach today about space environment out the solar wind. And so, so for me, uh, that encouragement uh, uh, is great. Uh, and uh, from him, uh, I was so excited about this that I actually uh, broke uh, every rule we had in NASA about mission uh, naming and I convinced others to break them with me. I'm not the only one uh, uh, to actually name a mission after a person alive. Uh, so for the first time in history, uh, there was a person with a name on the, on the rocket, uh, sitting to watch that very rocket take off. And I, I will always uh, find that as one of the most moving parts of my life to be able to pay back. Uh, because I, I saw it in his uh, uh, eyes when the tears came down, uh, how much it meant to him to get that recognition. Uh, the fact that he doesn't have a Nobel Prize doesn't say anything about him, but about the Nobel process, I would say. So I want to tell you a story. Uh, that you may or may not have seen on uh, TV. Um, it's a story about Bruce Bannard, a guy who I think will create a transformation of our understanding uh, with this team of Mars and the interior of Mars. And I'm there with him. Uh, uh, and so basically the story is about uh, inside mission uh, that, um, that uh, uh, we had to land on Mars. So the way uh, to land a mission on Mars is, is much, much more difficult than doing pretty much anything uh, that we're doing normally. If you want to, for example, come in and land on Earth, the good news is you have an atmosphere that slows you down most of the energy. So you come in from space, you know, you, you, and you need a heat shield that really, it, it will glow, but it will slow you down until you're uh, subsonic. You put a parachute out, it will slow you down with itself. You can get into the water. It won't kill you, even with people in it. Uh, you can put a few rockets on it to just slow you down and set it down nicely, but you don't need to. Well, on the moon or kind of an airless body, uh, the way you do it is all kind of just control system, just with a retro rocket, very hard, by the way, but a lot simpler than Mars because Mars is everything, all of the above. So you come in, and by the way, Mars is too far away. You can't joystick it. So it's like it has to be all loaded into the spacecraft and you're watching it happen. So you come in. And so the first thing that happens is, yeah, you have that shell. And then you put out a supersonic parachute because the shell does not slow you down enough. A supersonic parachute is doing what it can, but it's not good enough. So you have to put these retro rockets down and set yourself down. Everything has to work perfectly. It's so hard that humanity's record on landing on Mars is less than 40%. So most of the time, we fail. So I was sitting next to Bruce doing that. Well, in addition to that, what actually happened, where we wanted to land, we're on the away, uh, the away side from Earth. 
So kind of, if we had to land without any help, we would have only known whether we landed uh, many hours later until a spacecraft, either a European or a NASA spacecraft, went over it, and we basically said, I'm alive. Well, you don't like to do that. I mean, it's not good for your nerves. And so basically what we did is we put out two spacecraft that uh, were actually flying by Mars. And all they did is listening for the spacecraft to grab data and sending it back to Earth on a different frequency. And so basically they were mirrors, so to say, for the information that came out, two of them. Uh, these are spacecraft that easily fit in a suitcase. So they're really small, uh, much, much cheaper than the spacecraft itself. So I'm there and we're landing. I'm nervous, I'm a wreck. Because basically what happens if you have my job, you get trained. So that much of the training is the good case, that much of the training is the bad case. Like, what do I tell the press? You have the speeches ready to go. Like, the, if it's not working, you're ready to go, right? So you sit there, and you're a wreck. So I tell you what happened that really gave me calm, and it has to do with these small steps. Two days before I was there, and you're going to see all these people. They're going to be all in these shirts that I'm going to point to. I went to a meeting with the best navigators in the world that were right there, around the entire table, and they were arguing. One of the guys next to me is the guy who landed Viking. He's, he's a legend. And he argued with a young woman who was, used to be in my class across the table, and they looked at data trying to understand where the spacecraft is in its position. It's actually really hard to know to a few kilometers where the spacecraft is. Frankly, you need to use pulsars and relate uh, the, the position of the spacecraft relative to pulsars with high accuracy. You need many measurements to actually know where it is. And here's what happened. Only a few hours before we landed, we realized we need to correct because we came in long and we were going to go into areas which was full of debris, you know, uh, craters. So we needed to make a risky maneuver. You never want to do that because what happened, you have this risky maneuver, it went well. well the 24 hours before we landed, of the two spacecraft that were getting us the data back, one was lost for six hours. Couldn't get in touch with it. It, it was a little bit too cheap. So it, it, it shot itself off like your laptop, you know, does from time to time. You have to boot it again, and then it, it looks just like new. It did too. It made me a lot more nervous because it came back only just hours or half an hour or so before we went into. The second spacecraft started getting problems too. Like, really? Right, so it, it did no longer know where the stars were. So we're all there, but I knew that team of people is working. And so what happened next, I'm gonna just play you. Marco Alpha, Marco Bravo, maintain lock status. Altitude convergence, the radar has locked on the ground. Yes. Standing by for lander separation. Lander separation commanded. Altitude 600 meters. Altitude 400 meters. 200 meters. 80 meters. 60 meters. 30 meters. 20 meters. 17 meters. Standing by for touchdown. The most important thing I wanted to illustrate with that is the point I made early, that transformative thing to land there happens because of those little steps all these people did. Of course, it took the idea of that principal investigator and all the nervousness that he brought to that table. I, next to me, I was encouraging every time something good happened. We were talking about it in the back there, and we're all dealing with emotion in different ways. Some of us have shaky gin, some of us have a stare, I noticed, that's what I do. But, uh, but the point is, uh, of course, where we are, we're on the ground now, this is a selfie that we took uh, just last week, uh, today. We're going to take the French seismology instrument and put it down on the ground. Uh, we're going to then do the calibrations next week. We're taking the German instrument, uh, putting the 
uh, on the ground. And of course, the seismology instrument has Swiss engineering in it, uh, uh, electronics board uh, uh, of uh, tremendous capability uh, right there, hidden under that uh, surface. And I'm just so excited uh, to have it there and have that transformation begin of that knowledge with all those people uh, being at the heart of it, uh, because all of them contributed their their value, their important knowledge uh, to that. And that is what I believe I learned here. That's what I want to uh, really take away from uh, this award. And uh, my, I feel with this award to be encouraged to really do that, uh, also to pay it forward uh, to so many of them with my little uh, help, I can perhaps do a leap like this and uh, uh, have their own transformative journey. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas, for this fascinating account of the transformative journey. It certainly has transformed you over the last 25 years or so since you started here with talking to Len Fisk. And with it, you have managed to transform the world around you in a most fascinating way. So thank you, Thomas, for all that. Thomas is so kind to take a little bit of Q&A, but before we start with that, I would like to ask Dr. Del Ambrogio to come up uh, the stage and to talk. Thomas would like to talk to you, please. Yeah. Thanks so much. So I'm, I'm ambushing him. He does not know that. Uh, I just want to uh, tell you, I mean, you are... Uh, um, you retired until a very successful uh, time as State Secretary of Switzerland. And I'm going to talk to you about an American guy, uh, which basically has seen what you're doing from the outside. Uh, so basically for me, uh, the one thing that I knew since 2005, where we met for uh, the first time, is the advocacy you bring to the table. You talk about Switzerland in a way that I think many people don't appreciate, how you hold that flag high. Uh, I love that you're not just talking about two or three universities, like some of uh, Switzerland uh, sometimes do, but you, you basically talk about the entire uh, ecosystem of university, including some of these uh, educational institutions where mm. the very best technicians, the very best engineers uh, that I work with are educated. And then so you, of course, were part of a tremendous transformation and a leading part of a tremendous transformation with that. But you were also, uh, of course, a uh, uh, true advocate of space and an uh, uh, advocate of international collaborations. And uh, uh, when I talked to my team, my team felt really strongly. And I wanted to thank you on behalf of NASA uh, for everything you did for our uh, Swiss uh, American collaborations. And I wanted to give you a picture, uh, the first picture of Insight, of course, one of the collaborations that you did. I hope uh, it finds a place somewhere in your uh, retired world. And, uh, and, and we'll always remind you of the many thanks that I have personally uh, for what you do, for what you do but, uh, but we have uh, as an asset team for everything you have done uh, to further our collaborations. But thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Roger, please. This is not a I really appreciate your suggestion. I really do. I really do. And uh, I think it's also worth uh, talking uh, both to uh, the, uh, our ESA colleagues and uh, NASA about, because he's really played a tremendous role together with his team. I always think of him also in the context of his team. You know, I mean, you know, I think not just of Johannes guys, I think, I think of Josef Fischer, who's no longer here. 
uh, who, who has done that, right? And, and I really appreciate that. I just want to tell you, I told uh, everybody about you earlier in a different place. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Roger Bonnet, of course, knows the agony of doing these things that we do, these hard things. And every once in a while, you know, you know, he fevers there also uh, for the good of science. Exploration truly unites. And, uh, and I always love uh, the, the, the few emails you've sent to me, kind of congratulatory notes, all of them with kind of a little funny end. It's like uh, now you have to really start doing science or something <laughs> like that. But, uh, but uh, I really appreciate that suggestion. Thank you so much, sir. Questions for Thomas or further suggestions? <laughs> Put you all to sleep. <laughs> a really good question so you should know i've educated 20 phds you know who are uh, where are they i'm the uh, phd advisor and and uh what i tell them and it's kind of the kind of i'm going to use nerd speak uh, you will immediately understand uh when it comes to life only the low frequencies count focus on longer time frames kind of like the way the way you learn the way you transform it's kind of a lot of this transformation. It's a lot of tedious work, hard work, a lot of dead ends you find. And you have to focus on the longer time scale. Have, have patience. Keep your legs moving, but focus on the longer uh, time scales. If you do that, as opposed to the little up and down, you know, the discouragement at work when uh, somebody scoops you on a paper. Uh, we all have that, you know, or, or the little ups and downs. You basically focus on just getting better, learning more, uh, that is really the first advice. Focus on the longer time scale. Look at the low frequency. The other thing is, I'm a strong believer, uh, utilize the resources around you. Uh, the goal is not to win by yourself. Uh, mm. I, I couldn't have. I would not be standing here if it wasn't for the great people that gave me opportunities, the great people that, that supported me and, and uh, they're, uh, were there to support if they don't offer, ask them for help. Uh, so many people, uh, it's amazing how happy they are to support uh, somebody and just even being there, being a, a just listen and say, hey, this is what I think uh, you could do. Of course, think by yourself first. But after you're done with that, you know, go, go, go use the, the environment. That would be my, my second one. Don't, don't be shy. Don't be shy because at the end, uh, what will really happen with that, you, you, you cannot believe how many advocates you will find who will really want you uh, to be successful. And that ultimately, they will be there at the right juncture, the right way. And so, so you can't plan this kind of stuff. You know, if we lift our plan forwards. We tell the story backwards. Don't be confused. It's just hard work. And every once in a while, an opportunity comes along. Take it. Thank you. Yes, please. So I tell you why I studied physics. I told you why I went to Bern, but I, t I studied physics because I couldn't decide what to study. I think physics in many ways is the most meldable uh, subject area into many more careers than any of the others. So for me, physics is basically, if you're a good physicist, you know math, you know how to build models, you know, you know the meaning of a theory, you know experiments, you know all these things, and it turns out if you ask an economist what you really need today, they will tell you those things. They will not say physics. They'll say math, you know, all, all the things I just told you. Uh, there's uh, one of my very good friends, uh, Simon Efty, started this company, a data company, doing just that as a physicist. Uh, and, and so for me, that's what the beauty is of physics. I'm in love, always have been in love with nature itself. I mean, to me, uh, I mean, I'm not 
faking it. For me, understanding nature is has always been the motivation. And so for me, kind of being able uh, to to help that uh, from the position that I'm at uh, makes me feel good. But there's many other careers that physics uh, a physics subject area opens up and kind of a, a study uh, uh, does. And, and it's it, it, it's 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 a great uh, thing to do. I, and I'm sure that there's some mathematicians here. You uh, perhaps you can make your own pitch for math, but that will be my my uh, <laughs> pitch for physics because I hung I hung out a lot with the mathematicians. And I needed every one class I got there, uh, perhaps proving that one is larger than zero. I shouldn't have taken a whole week, but other than, <laughs> that, other than that. No, I, I mean, I, I just think it, it's because of its utility. It's because of it, the fact that it makes us think. And uh, those are the things that are characteristics for many, many careers. We have more questions? Do you allow me one? Oh, sorry. Nick first. Nick, Nick first. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you why I went into administration first. I actually realized there are physicists a lot better than me. I'm a good physicist. I, mean, I could make a good case study. I mean, I've been recruited to some of the top universities. I turned them down and so forth, you know, in the world. But, but there are people who are better. And I basically realized that I actually can help science more if I lift uh, the others with my other skills that, that I can bring to the table. And you're actually right. The thing I struggle the most with in my job is that kick. So what I, what I did, and it took me a while to get my people less nervous about it. I actually spent time with the people. So I, this morning, I spent time on the phone for an hour. At seven o'clock this morning, I spent time uh, with an, uh, for an hour with an engineer at, at the West Coast before he went to bed. And we talked about engineering, like actually building instruments, not, not, not how to attach screws and so forth. I love it the most. So if I learn about you know, often what I get is the kind of PowerPoint version of a project. I struggle with that sometimes. I'm getting better with it to kind of see the life behind it. But my version of actually understanding a project, I ask the team, show me. And I go into the meeting. I sit in the back row. I don't have value there other than I understand. Like the value to get of my navigation team meeting that I was there. All I said at the end is thanks for allowing me to sit here. And I didn't say any other thing. I, I, they're better than me but it helps me. And so for basically what, what I do is get enough of that. I spend enough of the time there that I, I take myself that hour or two and I go and check myself. I put on the bunny suits and I go look at hardware. And uh, perhaps I even am part of a kind of a down and in discussion uh, of which I'm, it's way over my head, but it gives me that sense. So I need that from time to time, like a booster shot, you know, but, but, uh, but I'm really glad I did it. And kind of many of the, the people that, are working with us, they're glad too, because I understand that what I call failure or kind of the, the challenges that we have are part of success, right? It's, it's not some kind of, and I don't mean in any way uh, a negative about any other education, but it's not some kind of MBA version, right? In which the chart is this linear thing forward, kind of a progress is, is something like that. And so kind of, yes, it has a trend, but it's, it has a lot of swings back and forth. So, so I, I try to do that, but, but you're right. That is for people like us. I'm sure you're the same because every time you talk about hardware, I see it in your eyes too, <laughs> right? Kind of uh, people who are like that, you know, like we need, I mean, we need to keep that in our life somewhere. And so that's what I do. I would, like to, I would like to add a data point to this. Thomas is predecessor as associate administrator for science missions. I don't remember the name. He was never visible. I went to the AGO year after year. NASA was present there with the next tire or next level of hierarchy. But Thomas was in office for a couple of months. He showed face at the AGO, and you have shown face ever since in conferences relating to science, showing value to science and taking value out of, of the conferences. So this, I think, is the transformative way Thomas is living. Thank you for that. By the way, the, the name is John Gronsfeld, and he's the guy who fixed the Hubble Space Telescope. 
He's an astronaut. <laughs> He's an amazing I, guy. He's an amazing guy. I thought it was Claude who fixed the Hubble test. Oh, they did it together. They flew okay. together. Okay. Yeah, they know each other really well, as Claude told me yesterday. Yeah. And Zurich, yeah. More questions for Thomas? Yes, Roger. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So he, they did it together. As always, it takes a team, right? So, yeah. so uh, what John did uh, is actually the guy who replaced the circuit board. So if you, you know, so so he's uh, he is just like Claude. He's also an astrophysicist, and uh, they trained together. And uh, John was on three flights, and Claude, I think, was also on three or even more. But uh, but so they know each other really well. There's multiple of them, and I was always great for that. I, every time I meet an astronaut of their age group, I ask them, "Do you know Claude Nicole?" Yes, of course. It was my chi childhood idol right uh, here. So, so I was uh, I was always really glad to be on the same stage with them now. Yeah. I have a question yeah. uh, for you, Thomas. You're, you're on a transformative journey. And of course, the journey is not coming to an end today and here. Yeah. It's going to continue. Are you telling me something? I don't know. So I <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, your predecessor, your pre predecessor, Len Fisk, uh, when he was in this position, or after he had stepped down from this position, he said, this is a hard position. You have to take decisions, and that makes you lose of the order of 10% of your friends every year. So after five years, he stepped down because he thought uh, in order to keep the half of his friends, uh, that, was, uh, that was the time to step down. Now, I think, Thomas, your skills probably could drop that number to 5% or even 2% of your friends. So I very much look forward to, to a decade or so in office, but of course you will not be able to do that job forever. Where do you picture yourself in 10, 15 years from now? I'm actually horrible at those kind of questions because I don't think that way. Okay. Kind of, I t what I tend to do is, I, I mean, I actually never think of the next job. I never have. Kind of interesting, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm not a planner. I try to learn the most I can from a given job and when I come to the end, I get off the bus. Then I figure out what's next. And I, so I've never planned ahead. I uh, did not. That was not a goal that I've always wanted to uh, have. Uh, it's a great job I'm having. I'm having fun. It's 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 great. It's a front view, a kind of front window view of of science as it's done in and from space. I mean, it, what couldn't be more exciting? But uh, but there's many other things that are just equally uh, fun, and I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I think uh, my hope was that in every case, it will have science in the narrative and it will have talent in the narrative as well. Those are the things I usually am about. Thomas, you Thomas. have a very important job in the US, basically showing the enthusiasm for science in a time where other areas of science are really getting the big trouble. Uh, science skepticism, uh, mm -hmm. some Oh, you're right. I'm spending a lot of time thinking about that and, 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 and doing that very thing. So, so what my job is, is to advocate for science up and out. Right, so kind of, I am the the person that basically, when there's a science budget being made, uh, whether it's in the White House or then on the Hill, uh, generally speaking, I'm the person who advocates for science. Uh, right. Uh, so, so the good news is I'm not fully responsible. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Uh, the bad news is it's me. Right. I am there that uh, that uh, that are doing that. Now, so I spend a lot of time on it. What are you asking though? Is a much broader question. And I think a question that, frankly, is a, I hope is a discussion that's happening around this university as a whole, as well as other universities, because it, it basically asks the question, like, how do we talk about science outside of the choir, outside of scientists? Uh, what I've been trying to do is actually uh, take on speaking engagement and audiences and in places where they usually don't get scientists. Because I think uh, the message that we have is in every way compelling. I mean. Insight, the landing that I that I showed you, uh, we think based on uh, estimates that we have, uh, was watched by uh, both in writing or on online or uh, on TV was watched by five billion people around the the Earth. 
uh, including a front page article of the state newspaper of Ter Tehran, which is basically a government peddling uh, newspaper generally. Exploration unites. We think we have a unique opportunity to do that and for us to really model what science is about. Science is about rigor too. We will not overstretch uh, what we're saying. We will talk about errors that we have. We will talk about the fact that it's hard. Sometimes one of the hardest challenges that I have is convince my team that we need to talk about things that are hard. I talk about things when something, like when we launched ISAT 2, we had struggles with that. I stood up and talked about the struggles. And I gave the team kudos for getting through those struggles. Uh, I uh, recently, with the Mars landing site uh, that, that we just announced, I told uh, the whole press that we actually are not quite sure yet or the technology is ready to land in that site because the technology needs to be well advanced over what we know right now. And we first need to know. The team was really worried about it. The press reacted really well. So for me, I tried to talk about it to talk to other audiences. Uh, I spent time on social media, not, not because for the same reason as my children, you know, <laughs> the, that, that's their escape. And they spend time there and, you know, two hours later, they're in the same corner on the same website. But, but you know, so for me, I'm there because I want to evangelize to others. Uh, by the way, they do great things there too. But, uh, but I want to evangelize there to audiences that, that don't read in the news. I mean, I, I learn from my kids a lot, right? So, so when I'm in the news in the New York Times, they never know. If I'm on Snapchat or Instagram, they know, right? So, so for me, it's about that, recognizing where uh, people are. But, but again, I think the educational institutions are part of that discussion. How are we actually able to talk about science in a way that uh, affects the person who's sitting next to you on the train or in the bus? Not that you want to make everybody's life hell uh, when you get on a bus, but I actually train there. I mean, kind of, I always felt that, that uh, kind of the randomness, especially if they start talking, of learning how to talk about science to an audience that is not you, is something that has really helped me. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, to me, I think uh, in our education, how do we think about this? I believe everything you said, the research that you do is so vitally important for our future. How do we talk about it, right? How do we talk? It's essential that people understand, just like it's essential to talk about health data and, and things that we uh, find in medicine. How do we talk about it in science? I think it's, it's perhaps the most important uh, challenge that is part of the job that I currently have and something I take seriously, but you have better ideas of what we should do, I'd like to know, because I don't think we have the full answer. Thank you. Roger, again? Okay. Let me tell you what my biggest worry was. So kind of, sometimes you can talk about vision in terms of pain. I think the biggest pain in space is that many people think that the most exciting part about space research and exploration was in the past. I believe the most exciting part of space research and exploration is in the future. We have just only just scratched the surface. And I believe for us to achieve what is possible in space research, uh, in, in research in and from space, we need to bring a new generation of excellent people to the table uh, that are bringing more diverse viewpoints uh, uh, into it. Uh, the teams that we're building right now can then eclipse uh, uh, what we have done in the past and build on that, honor it, but build on that forward. And so for me, uh, what I feel strongly about and what is really uh, being part of that uh, recognition and that transformation in which uh, at the agency, at NASA, and the median age, that's not good news. In other words, close to half the people are older than me. Uh, uh, a good fraction of them are eligible for retirement. Uh, and and so, so kind of that is, of course, a challenge, but it's an opportunity to retool and grow uh, that opportunity going forward. So for me, that's where I see uh, my value, uh, really to recognize that excellence comes from constant change, learning new things. It's not about holding a status. It's about moving that forward. That's what I'm about. Hector Leumann.
out of this process in which we have to take the decisions in those cases, you have heard about the Geneva Convention, and this gives us gives us science is a little bit extreme to shape all this discussion because whatever you will realize out there in space is transformative in the same time, not necessarily in the same way touching the technical questions of the physics. And I imagine that it is a, a big chance for you all to be not shying into the other disciplines and say, well, whatever we do should not stop. Uh, I need to say, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think it's, you know, transformations in science often have dealt with really difficult discussions. Sometimes it's ethics. Sometimes it's the opinions we bring to the table uh, that come from, uh, you know, places we spend Sundays in, you know, uh, you know uh, our religious environment or whatever it may be. It's, it's, it's uh, at these kind of challenges, kind of whenever innovation and ever advancement happens, these kind of challenges occur. Like kind of, we look at history; they happen many times. And and I, I, uh, I I'm deeply aware, of course, only from the outside. I'm not a practitioner of the science that you're doing. But deeply aware of the issues that are there. That are really hard ethics questions that are uh, that the community is struggling with. That of course touch more than just science itself, but brings in many other elements. Uh, and kind of practitioners that that are not really understanding science, understanding science at the level that frankly they need to. To actually make good contributions to it, right? And so, so for me, that breadth of education that I talked about at the gymnasium, or you know, that that really helped me, is actually works the other way too. I want lawyers also to have the same breadth. I want, you know, the 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 people that are advocates of ethics have the same breadth that they understand what a science uh, process actually means. The fact that there's so many failures or false stops, it's not really a failure. I don't think of it that way dead ends uh, associated with it. And so for me, that, that's, what, that's why this relates so much to educational organizations like that. But uh, I understand uh, what, where you're coming from and deeply uh, appreciate the work you're doing uh, here, but also uh, the, the recognition that yes, we can uh, kind of uh, much more broadly talk about that. Thank you. I think we can continue the discussion over a glass of wine. Yes, that's the best idea ever. So what remains for me to do is to thank you all for coming here, attending this Greinacher Award Ceremony 2018. I congratulate once again the award recipients, Michael Hofstetter, Chang Min Tsai, and you, Thomas. Thanks for your fascinating presentation of the transformative journey. I invite everybody to A, pick up a NASA calendar, thankfully brought to us from by Thomas, and to join us in the Wandelhalle for a glass of wine. Thank you for coming. The award ceremony is closed. <laughs>